The president's health has led to many concerns, cover-ups, and conspiracies. Grover Cleveland needed a critical surgery, but he didn't want to worry anyone, so he planned a secret operation on a boat that wasn't revealed for another 24 years. I'm Bob Summers, and this is a presidential story. Eighteen ninety three was a big year for Grover Cleveland. In March, he was sworn in as president again after having lost to Benjamin Harrison four years earlier, marking the first, and so far only, time a president would serve non consecutive terms. And his wife was pregnant with his second child, who would be born in September, Esther. And then there was this health thing. Shortly after his inauguration, Cleveland an avid cigar smoker noticed a bump on the roof of his mouth. By June, the bump had grown large enough that Cleveland asked his friend and presidential doctor, Major Robert O'Reilly, to take a look. O'Reilly discovered a lesion that he described as nearly the size of a quarter with cauliflower granulation. O'Reilly had the sample sent anonymously to the Army Medical Museum and consulted with Dr. William Welsh at John Hopkins. Both diagnoses reported malignancy, cancer. In the U.S. today, cancer is the second leading cause of death, but that wasn't the case in the 1890s. In that decade, the leading cause of death was consumption, today known as tuberculosis. Today, we're better able to manage consumption along with other diseases, plus in the 1890s, cancer was misdiagnosed more frequently, meaning cancer rates were not as high back then. And even so, newspapers of the day referred to cancer as the dread disease. Also weighing on Cleveland's mind would be the idea that the hero of the Civil War and former President Ulysses S. Grant had died from cancer just eight years earlier. There were also political considerations to a public cancer diagnosis. The panic of 1893 had just started. Hoping to strengthen the economy to pull the nation out of a financial depression, the president was leading a movement to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act and uphold the gold standard. In August, the president had to address Congress and thus he had to be able to recover from the surgery's effects before then. By this time, it was already late June. Furthermore, the president was concerned that reports of his condition would prove unsettling to the country, so the surgery would have to be done in secret, including from Vice President Adlai Stevenson. Soon, a plan was hatched. The president had this friend with a yacht, and we should all have a friend with a yacht, this friend was Commodore Elias Cornelius Benedict, a banker and the leading yachtist in America. He owned the 142-foot-long Oneida. Cleveland had already logged 50,000 nautical miles sailing and fishing on the Oneida, so that shouldn't raise suspicions. They planned a four-day fishing trip from New York to Cleveland's summer home Gray Gables on Cape Cod, where he would stay while he recovered, hidden from public view. On July 1st, six surgeons boarded the Oneida. Robert O'Reilly, William Keene, Joseph Bryant, Ferdinand Hasbrook, Edward Janeway, and J.F. Eidman. Hasbrook was a dentist and anesthesiologist, which was not an uncommon combination at the time. Hasbrook administered anesthesia and topically applied cocaine, yep, cocaine, and then pulled a couple of the president's teeth. Over the next 90 minutes, the surgeons removed the tumor along with five teeth, a third of Cleveland's palate, and a large part of the president's upper left jawbone. All of this material was extracted through the mouth, which meant no noticeable facial scarring and left his trademark mustache untouched, 
which were key conditions to keep the public in the dark. Overall, the surgery was a huge success. There was very little blood loss, and Cleveland made a steady recovery, although on July 17th, he returned to the yacht for another surgery to remove some malignancy around the edges of the removed bone. There was one area which was noticeable after the surgery, his ability to speak. Without part of his jaw and palate, his speech was unintelligible. So New York prosthodontist Kaysen Gibson took a cast of the president's mouth and fashioned a vulcanized implant to reconstruct the contours of the president's face so he could speak clearly. Later, Cleveland thanked Gibson, reporting that he could wear the implant all day with ease. On August 4th, President Cleveland returned to Washington. The president was described by reporters to be well-tanned, in perfect health, looking well and not the least weary, even though he was only two weeks after the second operation. On Monday, August 8th, Congress convened and received the president's message. Cleveland had two clerks from each chamber read his address, as was tradition at the time. Congress ultimately agreed with Cleveland and voted to repeal the Sherman Silver Purchase Act. During these initial public appearances, there had been no suspicion that the president had undergone a major oral surgery. However, on August 29th, two months after the, quote, fishing trip, and one day after the repeal of the Silver Purchase Act, Philadelphia press reporter E.J. Edwards published a story about the surgery, which was confirmed by one of Cleveland's doctors, allegedly Hasbrook. White House aides said that the president's only problem was the removal of a tooth, and fortunately a doctor was on board, which was partially true, but not even close to the whole truth. The closest Cleveland came to confirming the surgery was in a letter to a friend. The report you saw regarding my health resulted from a most astounding breach of professional duty on the part of a medical man. I tell you this in strict confidence, for the policy here has been to deny and discredit this story. As Cleveland denied the report, he started a smear campaign to discredit the reporter. Edwards was dismissed as a disgrace to journalism. So how does this story end? Although Cleveland was able to address Congress that August and get his initiative passed, he had lost much of his old energy. He was often irritable and suffered some hearing loss. The economic depression would persist for the remainder of his term and by the time he left office in 1897, his party had pretty much disowned him. In 1917, 24 years after the operation, when only three witnesses were still alive and nine years after Cleveland died from a heart attack, one of the surgeons, William Keene, came clean in an article in the Saturday Evening Post explaining what really happened vindicating Edwards. Keen and the prosthodontist Gibson had kept the tissue specimens in alcohol and donated them to Philadelphia's Mutter Museum in 1917. In 1980, pathologists from the University of Pennsylvania asked the Mutter Museum if the specimen could be re-examined. After permission was granted, the examination by the pathologist revealed that the lesion was a verrucous carcinoma, effectively treated by the surgery. Overall, this was a crazy operation. Today, the same surgery would take several hours in a non-moving room. This was 90 minutes on a moving, pitching boat. And if the president wanted to have a secret surgery today, the logistics would be much easier, as Air Force One has a fully equipped operating room but they still have to contend with the turbulence. That's the story of President Cleveland's secret surgery. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click the like button and subscribe to hear more presidential stories. And please visit POTUS.com to learn more interesting facts about the presidents.